Hey, good morning, New Testament 3. Uh, we're taking a look at Revelation 13 today, so before you watch this video, make sure you download your notes from, um, from the Google Classroom. Also have your Bible open to Revelation chapter 13, and we'll begin. So you might need to pause it, go do that, and then come back. Welcome back. Let's pray. Father, today I pray that you would open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word, that you would remind us of things that we've studied before and things that we have not learned. I pray they will be a blessing to us, that they would inform and shape our theology of you and help us to understand the events that must take place before Christ returns. And Father, I pray you'll be glorified with things that we're thinking about, the attitudes of our heart toward you and toward your word. And I pray that you would change our heart to find us delighting in your scriptures and delighting in your presence and in your fellowship. Help me to teach this well today. Let me glorify you and how I teach it. And it's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. All right, so we're taking a look at Revelation 13. You'll probably find this to be a very interesting chapter because it has to do with the arrival on the scene of the Antichrist and the false prophet. Uh, you're going to find that uh, John uses two uh, names uh, for them that are unusual. He calls one the first beast, and he calls one the second beast. And so when we talk about the first beast that shows up, it is the Antichrist. The second beast is the false prophet. So you might want to just make a little note to yourself about that. I might use the terms interchangeably. But take a look at chapter 13, verse 1. John says, and this is, this is right on the heels of him seeing Satan cast down to the earth. So he is cast out of heaven. He's cast down to the earth. There doesn't seem to be a strict timeline between chapter 12 and chapter 13. Because we know that Satan was cast down to the earth back when Adam and Eve were first in the garden. So he's compressing all of human history up until this point uh, with regards to uh, uh, the, the activity of the devil. And so the devil stands on the shore of the sea. You see that at the end of chapter 12, verse 17. He stood on the sand of the seashore. And he said, I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads and ten diadems, that's crowns, on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. The sea, as has been the case throughout the years, but especially in the ancient times, the sea was feared for what lay underneath the waves. It was a place of mystery. It was a place where they felt like that was the haunt of evil spirits. The ten horns that are mentioned here, you also see again in Revelation 17, verses 12 through 14, a passage we'll look at before the end of the year, uh, hopefully. Uh, there are ten kings, and their one purpose is to turn over their power to the Antichrist. Their authority becomes his, and he kind of wears their authority on his head. Those crowns are his. So if you look at him, the idea is, is that this guy has power over all kings, over all kingdoms, and over the entire earth. And so that authority becomes his. This was prophesied back in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7. The seven heads, the number seven is usually a number that has to do with completion, a perfect number. Uh, I, I say this kind of jokingly, but even in the gambling, right? Come on, sevens. They need sevens for some reason. Sometimes 11, I think. But anyway, my point is, is that in that ancient times, in the first century, it was considered to be a perfect number. Uh, it's the number of completeness. It indicates knowledge. If he has seven heads, it's complete knowledge, complete direction, and honestly, leadership. Because if you have complete knowledge and direction, and you're setting that direction, you have full leadership. So it's indicating that this, um, this uh, 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 power or this authority that he has is worldwide. And he also says that he has on its head um, blasphemous names on his heads. That beast rising up out of the sea, that tells you that he's evil. The fact that he has ten horns says that he has authority over all of the known kingdoms of the earth. The fact that he has seven heads means that he has complete knowledge and leadership. And he's filled with blasphemous names. Sometimes names that we would apply to God or to Jesus Christ are, were given to Caesar, such as Caesar is Lord. It was the, it was the uh, oath of loyalty to the Roman Empire to say Caesar is Lord. And Christians wouldn't say it. That's what got many of them killed in the first century, was they wouldn't say that Caesar was Lord. So this would be a, an idea that we should give the same kind of allegiance and worship to the Antichrist that only belongs to Christ. 
So you see this, and if you're reading this in the first century, you're like, uh-oh, this is the bad guy. Back when movies were in black and white, how do you tell which cowboy was the good cowboy, and how would you tell that he was the bad cowboy? Well, the good cowboys, because everything was shades of gray and black and white and so forth in these shows and movies, the good guy would wear a white hat, and the bad guy would wear a black hat. That's how you knew. So if he comes onto the scene wearing a black hat, all of a sudden you're like, that's the bad guy. Especially if he had a, like a crazy mustache and so forth. But the black hat was to let you know that this was the evil one. Otherwise you wouldn't be able to tell because they were all shades of gray. So when we talk about uh, Antichrist, that's his black hat. This is the bad guy. He comes up out of the sea and he has all this authority. Okay, good. Uh, Revelation uh, 13 and verse 2, we find out that this beast has uh, feet like a bear's. He was like a leopard. Its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it, the dragon gave his power, throne, and great authority. Got to pay close attention as we walk down through this passage. We know that the Antichrist is powered by Satan. And John, as he's writing down what he sees, is actually saying this is a fulfillment of prophecy from Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. The Antichrist is powered by Satan. So we're going to see a human being come on the scene with great authority and leadership and power, but he's actually being powered by Satan. Notice the tense of the verbs in that passage. He was like a leopard, and the dragon, to it, the dragon gave his power, throne, and authority. He didn't take that power, throne, and authority. It was given to him. And you'll see this all the way through this, pow this uh, chapter, uh, that authority was given to him. Power was given to him. A throne was given to him. He didn't create it, and he didn't take it by force. It was given to him. Satan said, here's my authority, power, and, and throne, and it's now yours. And what we see here is that with the, the uh, Antichrist and with the false prophet, Satan is actually setting up somewhat of an evil trinity. Satan, who has wanted to be God since back in Isaiah, back before uh, time, before he was cast down to the earth, he wanted to be like God. Well, he sets, it, excuse me, he sets himself up like he's God the Father. We have the first beast who is going to look like a worldwide savior and lord of the earth. He would be the Antichrist, and he is a poor imitation of the Christ. And then the Holy Spirit, of course, his ministry is to promote Jesus. And so we find that this second beast, which we should see here in just a little bit, is the false prophet. He is going to promote the Antichrist as much as the Holy Spirit promotes the Christ. So he sets up kind of an unholy uh, trinity to kind of mimic and mock God. So in verses 3 and 4, we find out that he seems to receive a mortal wound. But the mortal wound is miraculously healed, and the whole earth marvels at this, and they follow him. There is so much stinking irony in this uh, situation here, because Christ really did die, and he really was resurrected, and so many people reject that. Now, this joker comes on the scene. I say joker in the nicest possible way. This joker comes on the scene. He seems to receive a mortal wound, unlike the real mortal wounds that happened to Christ. And this wound is miraculously healed. He has this fake resurrection. He imitates it with a false resurrection. He imitates Christ. And the world's like, wow, they marvel at that. We've never seen anything like it before. Hello? Yes, you did. You saw it at Calvary. We just celebrated the death, burial, and resurrection a couple weeks ago here in, um, in, in 2020. So we find out that people will worship him. And they're going to worship the dragon, verse 4 says. They're worshiping Satan. And they don't even realize it. Remember that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that he masquerades as an angel of light. Satan never looks like Satan. Otherwise, nobody would ever follow him. But he wears the mask and he plays the part very well. And he dupes so many people that are ignorant of what he's up to. So men will worship both Satan and the Antichrist. And they make this statement about the Antichrist that really has already been made about the Lord back at Exodus chapter 15. Who is like the beast? And all through the scriptures, especially in Exodus 15, who is like the Lord? To whom will you compare him? Uh, the Lord says throughout a uh, psalm. Bring all contenders. I'll take them on. I'll take them on one by one or in mass. Just bring all the pretenders who say that they're God and let them stand next to me. We'll see who God is. 
and on earth we got people that are just more than willing to give their allegiance to that which is not God and they refuse to follow the one true God. So as I mentioned in verses 5 uh, through 7, uh, we find that he was given a mouth to utter haughty or proud and blasphemous words and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months, that's three and a half years. And it opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all the earth will worship it. Oh, wow. So we see the Antichrist come on the scene and he was given everything. He is not powerful in and of himself. The only way that he acquires power and authority is that it's given to him. Jesus says that he has all authority and all power and so forth. But this Antichrist has nothing. And so the scripture tells us that uh, men are going to uh, worship this beast, this Antichrist, even though he was given everything that he has. First of all, he's given a mouth to blaspheme. And he gets that mouth to blaspheme for 42 months, which is equal to three and a half years. The Antichrist will slander God. Slander is false gossip. Gossip might be true. It certainly is unnecessary and is usually cruel. Uh, slander is false gossip. So it's like the double whammy right there. So he gives slander against God, saying falsehood about him. He says falsehood about heaven, the dwelling place of God, and also against God's people. I hate slander. I hate gossip. But I have to recognize that if I'm going to follow Christ and people recognize me as a follower of Christ, people are going to talk smack about me. They're going to talk trash about me. And they're going to do that to you too. If you resemble Christ and remind people of Christ, you will also be slandered. Uh, letter B, he's given a power to make war and to conquer believers. Um, this is kind of the shocker, especially for Americans, because we're typically like, if we go to war, we're going to win. That's our mindset, right? We're going to conquer this. We're going to beat this thing. You got this. You can do it, bro. That kind of thing. Mm -mm. If you're a Christian, the Lord's plan, his sovereign will is for you to go down. You're going to be conquered. If you're alive at that time, you will be conquered by the Antichrist. But it's all part of God's sovereign plan. I'd rather go down in defeat because that's God's plan than to go down in defeat because I'm an idiot. When I think about the, the will of the Lord to have people conquer his people, that's stunning. That's absolutely stunning. We try so hard to preserve our way of life, and here God is saying, I'm going to take away the way, way of life that you're accustomed to for this reason, because it's going to lead to the downfall of the Antichrist. Count me in, Lord. Count me in. He's also given authority over all people and nations. Now keep in mind, he has authority over them, but he's not their Lord. And so for Christians living at this time on the earth, they will be persecuted by this Antichrist. And where are you going to go? He's a worldwide ruler. He has authority over all peoples and nations. won't be a place you can flee to. There won't be a Christian island haven or a Christian Alaska or Christian Florida or something like that. Yeah, there's nowhere you can run, nowhere you can hide. It is what it is. The Lord's plan is coming to fruition, and you're part of it if you're alive at that time. Uh, who actually worships the beast? If you look at verse 8, this is one of my favorite verses in Scripture. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it, worship the Antichrist. Oh, everyone, that is, whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Now, I'm going to make this statement. And for some of you, you will probably get uh, irritated by it. And that's on you. You're going to have to deal with what the Scripture says. The scripture says that there were names written in the book of life before the foundation of the world. And those are the Christians. Those are the saints. And you can trace that Bible study uh, all the way through uh, scripture. Uh, Moses knows about it. He mentions it in the book of Exodus chapter 32. But here we find that this book of life was written before the foundation of the world. An omniscient God does not need to look into the future to determine who was going to be saved. If you're omniscient, you already know all things. And you cannot be taught anything because you already know them. Wouldn't that be a great trait to have when you go to college? But God knows everything. And those names were written into the book of life before the foundation of the world. Those are Christians. And those are the ones who will not worship the beast. If your name is not in the book of life, I guarantee you, you will be worshiping the beast. Friends, the time to come to Christ is now. If you're alive at that time, you need to know that there's an Antichrist. 
He's not the real deal, but you can come to know the real God now. More tomorrow.